From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The 2024 presidential race gets more crowded this week with former Vice President Mike Pence and New Jersey Governor Chris Christie expected to announce their campaigns as New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu takes a pass with some advice for the GOP. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with The Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Bill McGurn and editorial board member Kate Batchelder Odell. Chris Christie, a former federal prosecutor, became famous after his election as New Jersey governor in 2009 for public put-downs and smackdowns of political opponents, including members of teachers' unions and others who challenged him, members of the press. And he now he aims to bring that to the 2024 debate stage. Bill, you've watched Chris Christie's governorship and his political career. What do you make of this move after he failed to get any traction in the 2016 presidential race? Well, I think on the debate stage is very different from the polling booth. The former governor is very unpopular in New Jersey. His first term, as you say, he did some good things, renegotiated contract with the teachers unions, the pension fund, a little reform. But he kind of stopped for the second term because he's running for president and his shtick was he was a red state guy in a blue state and he didn't do anything. And then we found the scandals about closing the George Washington Bridge in retaliation for a Democratic mayor who wouldn't back him and so forth. So I think he's mixed back. He can be very effective on stage. He took out Marco Rubio very effectively, but I don't know it's going to get him anywhere. On the point about his debate, demeanor and his willingness to challenge other candidates, I think that could be an addition to this debate that Republicans are having right now. I think many of the Republican candidates are treating President Trump with kid gloves. In part, it may be a similar dynamic to we saw in 2016, which is that they hope he will eventually fall on the polls and they will benefit. They will be able to pick up his supporters if they are perceived as aligned with him. And Chris Christie is taking a different approach. Let's listen to a piece of his response after President Trump's recent CNN town hall. President Trump refused to take sides on the war in Ukraine to say that he wanted Ukraine to defeat Russia's invasion. And this was uh, how Chris Christie responded to the Hugh Hewitt radio show. He's a coward, and I think he's a puppet of Putin. I really do. I, I think, I don't know why I say the truth. I can't figure it out. But there's no other conclusion to come to. He wouldn't say last night that Ukraine should win the war. I mean, I was stunned. It was To me, it was the most stunning moment of the debate. If you won't say that you think Ukraine should win the war, um, I don't know where you, you stand with Putin. Kate, that is certainly a different tone than we are hearing from Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or some of these other people who are now campaigning in Iowa and New Hampshire. Sure. So we know Chris Christie, as we said in our editorial today, part of his aim is mixing it up in the news cycle. And some of these provocations are good and productive and do move the party in a constructive direction. I think the Ukraine speaking honestly that Trump is wrong about Ukraine, that he's saying, oh, I could end 24 hours with absolutely no details, is not a serious response. I'd add, too, that Christie had some some other good contributions in 2016 to the debate. He was willing to talk openly about entitlement reform, which in Washington has really gone out of style. And now the Congress talks about balancing the budget without dealing with entitlements, which are two-thirds of spending. I mean, this is an area where Christie could also insert some real discipline on the party. My personal favorite from 2016 is when he said he wanted to fly Air Force One over the South China Sea to show China he's serious. I mean, so he is got this plain talking reputation and sometimes it's really useful. The problem is, is that it didn't work in 2016 against Trump. And I don't think his relative star has risen since then. And Trump's, I think, has fallen substantially for all the reasons we've discussed. But it's not clear to me why that would work this time if it didn't last time. And so there are some real questions about who will Christie help. And what exactly his goal is. I can envision Chris Christie as a guided missile aimed at President Trump. And if he knocks him out with some debate blow, he will be satisfied with that as victory. But he is saying that he is in it to win it. Here's what he recently told the reporter, quote, I'm not a paid assassin. When you're waking up for your 45th morning at the Hilton Garden Inn in Manchester, you better think you can win. 
and some vintage Christy humor and wit there. But Bill, it does raise the question of if he is really in it to win it, then is he going to be taking swings not only at President Trump, but also other contenders who Republicans who don't want Trump may be feeling a little bit more favorable toward, including Ron DeSantis? Look, if you're going to run for president, you have to say you're running for president. You're not just a hitman to go after one person. I think Christie has some credibility issues there. You know, in 2016, after the debates, he backed Trump. Then when the Access to Hollywood came out, he kind of distanced himself from Trump. Then Trump won, and he was there on the evening selected. Then he fell out with Trump. I'm not sure he's the most credible guy and has much of base in the Republican Party. But it's good for people to mix it up. I think if you're another, forget about Trump you're one of the other candidates. If you can't stand up to Chrissy, you know, you can stand up to Putin or Xi Jinping. So let the tough questions begin. Kate, there's also a question of whether Christie will get that opportunity on the debate stage. The first Republican debate is going to be held in August. And the Republican National Committee recently explained what its rules will be. Participating candidates need to show they have at least 1% support in the polling, plus 40,000 individual donors. And that is not exactly a small number of individual donors. And then there's also the question of whether President Trump even plans to show up for some of these debates. Right now, he is leading in the Real Clear Politics polling average by about 30 points. And so he may decide he has more to lose from getting on a debate stage with these people, and he can float above it and issue truth social quasi tweets about it as his opponents are tearing each other apart. Yeah, Kyle, I mean, to your point, Chrissy has to get some traction here to get on the debate stage. And it's one of those cases where his moment might have really been 2012 before some of this other stuff that we discussed happened. And he missed it. And that is that there's certainly a lesson there for other Republicans who are thinking about running for president. On the question of the debate stage, that's a risk for Trump and maybe more so than he really appreciates to try to skip out on the debate and give his opponents an opportunity to talk about him for 90 minutes and why he's not the pick without offering a response. I really think Trump is assuming that the political scene hasn't changed much since 2016 when his style of politics and debating, if you want to call it that, was considered really novel. Now, currently, the country has seen a lot of it. And the question is whether they have as much of an appetite for it or making a compelling case about why it's time to move on, he won't be there to answer it if he skips the debate. So I think there's a risk contained in that strategy and he might have to show up. 